Well, good evening, attendees. Uh, welcome, NSHSS members, friends, parents, educators, um, to the continuation of our series following the COVID-19 pandemic over the past year. We did have a panel early in 2020 about COVID-19 safety, and now here we are in 2021 with our panel about COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so we are here tonight to answer all of your questions. We have a fantastic panel here for you tonight. So uh, we hope you're excited to be here as much as we are. So firstly, of course, I'd like to thank our panel sponsor, which is Health Professions Week, which has been a partner of NSHSS for a very long time. We really appreciate all of the work that Health Professions Week has put in to provide these resources to our members. Um, thank you for making this virtual session possible. We really, really appreciate you, our friends. Um, and the goal of today's panel uh, this evening is to provide you the most up-to-date information on the available COVID-19 vaccines that are available in the US right now um, in the state of the rollout. So the panelists speaking to you today, they're highly, highly qualified in the medical field. So um, take it from us, from NSHSS. You can definitely trust these folks here tonight. Uh, so more on those folks in, in a moment, but at this time, I'll just welcome our friend, Ms. Mandy Now from Health Professions Week to provide more information about this amazing event happening this fall. Mandy? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us tonight. Um, and thank you to our audience for uh, attending this very special webinar. Um, I want to say thank you to our partners who really made this possible tonight. Grace at the uh, Society for High School Scholars, the American Association of Medical Colleges, the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy, and the Association of University Programs and Health Administration. It's truly through these partnerships that Health Professions Week can bring to our audience such important topics like what we're gonna to discuss tonight. My name is Mandy Now, and I am the Executive Director of Health Professions Week. We're a nationwide collaboration of over 20 health and education association and organizations that make up over 26 different pathways into the healthcare careers. I like to say that we're from the optometrist to the podiatrists and everything in between. Um, and those are uh, eye doctors and foot and ankle doctors if you don't know what that is. I'd like to invite all of you to check out our event, which is scheduled for this upcoming November. Health Professions Week is a wonderful opportunity for you to explore a variety of health occupations. Uh, Grace is going to put into our chat the links so that you'll quickly be able to add yourself to a mailing list and then check out some of the upcoming events that we have on our website. With that, I am excited to turn this event over to our moderator for this evening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mandy. We hope to see you all at Health Professions Week. It is a free event, so definitely save the date for that online event if you're interested in health professions, which we know many of you are. So thank you, Mandy, again, for helping us make this panel possible. Um, my name is Grace Dent, obviously. I'm manager of partnerships and events here at NSHSS. Uh, I will not be talking to you that much tonight because you're not here to listen to me. Um, so I will introduce you now to our panel. Um, Dr. Joey Crosby um, has been a professor of health administration for the past 26 years with Georgia Southern University. He's been a practicing clini clinical pharmacist for the past 30 years and has served as a consultant to public health and pharmaceutical industry companies during those years. Dr. Crosby also has over 50 published articles and research presentations in the fields of health services research, pharmaceutical economics, and health policy. Dr. Gretchen Kreckel Garofoli is an associate professor at West Virginia University School of Pharmacy. She is a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy and completed a community based pharmacy residency at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Her current practice site is Waterfront Family Pharmacy in Morgantown, West Virginia, where she focuses on immunizations, diabetes care, medication synchronization, adherence packaging, and medication therapy management. She's currently serving as the coordinator of the American Pharmacist Association Academy of Pharmacy Practice and Management Immunizing Pharmacist Special Interest Group for the 2020-2021 academic year. 
Dr. Ross McKinney Jr. is the Chief Scientific Officer of the Association of American Medical Colleges. Dr. McKinney joined the AAMC in 2016 after serving as a member of the Duke faculty since 1985. During his time at Duke, he was Director of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases, Vice Dean for Research at Duke University School of Medicine, and Director of the Trent Center for Bioethics, Humanities, and History of Medicine. At the AAMC, he leads an array of programs that support all aspects of medical research and training. He also represents the AAMC nationally on issues related to research and science, policy, administration, workforce development, and education and training. And finally, our moderator, Dr. Jan Leifman, belongs to the NSHSS Fellows, which is a group of professionals who stay involved with our community who are giving back to our younger members. He has also been recognized as one of the top international researchers in oncology by the American Society of Hematology and American Society of Clinical Oncology. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Leifman was recruited to join the Global COVID-19 Task Force to serve as a special advisor for immunology, oncology, and cellular therapeutics, and was made director of the immunology division. He was recently recognized as a 2020 New York State and City Manhattan hero for his community service and research contributions during the COVID-19 pandemic and by Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center for Research Excellence. Doctors, NSHSS is so honored to have you here with us tonight. Um, and clearly these folks are qualified to speak to you about these issues that we're facing in the world today. So without further ado, I will give the floor over to our panel moderator, Dr. Leifman, over to you. Thank you so much, Ms. Dent, for such a warm introduction. So everyone, welcome to tonight's panel discussion with our esteemed experts. The format of this event will be a short information session where each of our speakers will provide insight about the biology of viruses, vaccines, vaccination indications, and policy. This will be followed by a question and answer session during which the audience can submit questions that will be read to our esteemed panel. And with that, let's begin. So Dr. McKinney, can you please provide us with some background on viruses, vaccines, and COVID-19? Okay, well, I'm very delighted to be here and I hope uh, I'm able to tell you clearly the story of uh, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 and the vaccinations. Next slide. So this is the villain. There really is only one villain and this is the villain. This is the, an electron micrograph of a coronavirus. And, and what you can see is a sort of amorphously shaped virus with little spikes sticking out of it. Those spikes reminded somebody when they first saw this electron micrograph uh, of a crown. So it is a crown virus, coronavirus. And those spikes are also absolutely critical because they're what we can attack with our vaccines and which enable us to protect ourselves uh, against um, the virus with vaccination. Next slide. So SARS-CoV-2 is technically an enveloped beta coronavirus. In that, what matters is the word enveloped. An envelope means that a virus has a fatty lipid bilayer on the surface. When it buds through the cells that it's infected, it acquires the surface of the cell as part of itself. And that's a lipid bilayer. That fatty bilayer makes the virus susceptible to soap and to alcohol because they dissolve fats. So, so SARS-CoV-2 is very easily inactivated by either hand washing or by alcohol um, disinfectants. Uh, about 80% of the genetic material is the same as in the SARS-CoV-1, which was the very lethal SARS uh, disease that was seen about uh, 20 years ago. And then the, 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 the story of the way the virus works is that surface protein, the spike on the surface, those spikes bind to a protein, which is part of the surface of normal cells called ACE2, stands for angiotensin converting enzyme 2. So it's a protein that normally converts an enzyme that, that's a, a regular regulator uh, of uh, vascular um, tension. Um, so it, it's a protein that's on the surface of the cells for another reason. And the virus basically hijacks that protein on the surface of the cell and binds to it. And then it binds to another protein, which is a transmembrane serine protease, TMPRSS2, 
don't have to remember that. But basically what you need to know is it attaches to one protein, then it binds to the second, then it gets sucked into the cell. And once it's in the cell, it can go through its replicative cycle. Now, antibodies, which are an immune reaction our body makes, can attach to the binding part of that spike protein. So it attaches to the binding part and blocks the virus from being able to enter the cell and replicating. It blocks its ability to attach to the ACE2 molecule. Next slide. So this is what the virus looks like and you can see those spikes um, and um, I can't um, show you, but the yellow things, there are the spikes on the surface. Beneath that is the uh, lipid bilayer with some protein sticking. And then in the middle, in the red part, is the RNA of the virus. It's um, a, a single positive strand RNA virus. Next slide. So here is a diagram of what happens. You can see at the top, the virus attaches to those two proteins, the ACE2 and the TMPRSS2, and, and then it's sucked into the cell. Once it gets into the cell, it loses that lipid bilayer, it releases its RNA. That RNA is translated into another protein, which is what RNAs are translated into proteins. And it is also replicated into other copies of the RNA. And then the virus assembles itself and it buds out of the surface. Where we can make a difference the most easily is by blocking the attachment of the virus to the cell by blocking the attachment of the spike protein to the ACE2 molecule. Next slide. So how do viruses spread? Well, viruses are not free living organisms. They're not like bacteria. They require access to live cells in which to grow. They get into the cell and they replicate inside the cell. Take for example, skin cells. If I smeared uh, coronavirus on your skin, not a darn thing would happen because skin cells are dead. So there's nothing there that can replicate. Um, only if I move it from this surface, like if I lick it, then I can transfer it from that dead surface to a mucous membrane. And our mucous membranes, the nose, the mouth, the eyes, the GI tract, the genital surfaces, all have live cells and they all have live cells so that we can exchange materials from the environment with ourselves. And the viruses take advantage of those live cells and that's how they get into um, us as, as organisms. Um, some viruses are very stable in the environment, some are not. Enteroviruses like polio can stay in the environment for years. In contrast, HIV always needs to be surrounded by water. So all the way that HIV is spread involve it being in water, surrounded by water. Measles wafts happily in the air. Next slide. So the ways that viruses spread, aerosols are very small particles that are released that can spread far distances. In fact, I can remember a story where basically everybody who wasn't vaccinated in an auditorium in, in uh, Concord, North Carolina, got infected at a basketball game when one kid showed up with measles because the virus so efficiently spread that everybody who hadn't been vaccinated in the room got infected. Um, influenza spreads by droplets, but only to people who are within about a six foot radius because those droplets fall to the ground fairly quickly. HIV and herpes simplex spread by physical contact, membrane to membrane, very close. And then there's fecal oral spread, which is um, some viruses are shed in feces and spread like norovirus um, and rotavirus and spread um, through fecal oral route. It gets put out in somebody's feces, somebody else um, puts it into their mouth. And then you can also spread things by fomites, which is mechanical surfaces. Like, for example, if a kid in a classroom, a three-year-old licks a block and hands it to another three-year-old, it'll spread from one kid to the next. That's a fomite. Turns out the fomites are not important in coronavirus. Next slide. So this is what the droplets look like. The size of the droplet determines how far it goes. Coronaviruses are concentrated in those droplets that fall at about the three to six foot range. As best we can tell, live 
coronaviruses do not spread much by aerosols, maybe a little bit, but not much. They dry out too quickly. Next slide. So coronaviruses are a frequent cause of the common cold and some GI symptoms. And there are four variants of coronavirus that have been circulating for years uh, around the world, and they cause a common cold. SARS, which was the really bad respiratory, um, serious acute respiratory syndrome, um, spread through sewage systems um, and also spread through, um, aeros or through uh, droplets. Um, colleges have been able to monitor SARS-CoV-2 by looking at the sewage from out of the dormitory and seeing if it's positive. If it's negative, it means everybody who's been using the, um, the bathrooms in the dormitory are in fact not infected. So it's a way that you can monitor where there are infections in a, in a college. Next slide. So now let's get down to the vaccines. There are basically five, um, four approved, uh, three approved vaccines and five that are close. So three approved vaccines. And the first two to be approved were um, Moderna's vaccine and Pfizer-BioNTech's vaccine. These are both mRNA vaccines. They basically take the messenger RNA from the virus, from the original Wuhan strain of the virus, and put it into, um, uh, there's a small modification that stabilizes it, so it keeps it in an open configuration, because it would collapse. So it keeps the spike open, but basically it's the original strain, and, and then it puts it into a lipid droplet. Those lipid droplets with the mRNA are injected under the skin. The lipid is absorbed onto the surface of the cells, gets accepted in, the RNA goes into the cells. The RNA makes a copy or two of the protein, it makes a few copies of the spike protein, and then it's digested by the mRNAs, which are enzymes in the cell, which normally regulate protein production by um, uh, breaking down the mRNA as soon as it's um, uh, completed its translational process. So you make a few copies, then it goes away, it's digested. So there's no carryover. The, the, the virus is gone, basically, um, after a period of a, of a few days because the mRNAs are all digested. Um, the next vaccine is the J&J &J vaccine. J&J's vaccine, Johnson & Johnson or Janssen, is based on an adenovirus, which is a respiratory virus, and, and it's given as a single dose. It uses the virus to carry the uh, a, a DNA, which is then transcribed into the RNA and makes the spike protein. AstraZeneca is very similar. It uses a chimpanzee's adenovirus. And finally, there's a company called Novavax that's making a protein vaccine. And those are all in various degrees of study. Next slide. Um, this is one of the most important slides to know about. This was the rate of cases with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine after the initial first vaccination. So they looked at, they were vaccinating people when there was still COVID in the community, and they looked at how quickly people got infected. So every circle is another case. And what you can see is that about day 10, the people who got placebo in red kept getting infected. And the people who got the vaccine in blue stopped getting disease. They stopped getting infected. So about day 10 is how long it takes for the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine to actually do its work. So you actually get about 80% of the protection that the virus, the vaccine gives after the first dose. You get a boost after the second that takes your antibody to much higher level and that takes it into the range where we ought to be protected against the variants. Next slide. So what are the variants? So many viruses, RNA viruses like HIV have a very high transcription error rate. When they make copies of themselves, DNA to DNA has what's called error checking. So you don't wanna get mutations. That's what ends up in cancer. So when you copy your DNA molecule, you copy it perfectly. When a DNA virus copies its, uh, uh, its DNA, it copies it perfectly. RNA viruses don't have a proofreading function, so they mutate. In HIV, those mutations are sorted by survival rate. You know, If the virus doesn't, uh, mutates in a bad way, it doesn't survive. Now, what turns out to happen is that SARS-CoV-2 has a proofreading function. So it's atypical for an RNA virus. And in fact, the original 
Wuhan derived sequence was the same until Italy when one mutation occurred. And almost all the virus that was spreading had only one mutation from what the original virus was. So this is a very tightly maintained and regulated virus uh, by RNA virus standards. Next slide. So these are the famous variants. So A1 is the isolate from Wuhan. That was originally used to create the vaccines. B1, which had a um, mutation in the 614th uh, gene in the um, spike protein, um, is a um, single mutation that became the predominant strain. So it left the spike protein a little bit open, so it made the virus more contagious, but it didn't change its pathogenicity. It didn't make people sicker. The first bad variant was the one that was seen in England, B117. Uh, and that one increased contagiousness by about 50% and increased mortality by about 60%. And B117 is what is currently causing a lot of the outbreak in Michigan and is causing disease to occur in younger people, is causing disease to occur in people not in the older age group, but in younger age group. B1351 was first seen in South Africa. It's resistant to some of the neutralizing antibodies and it's more resistant to the vaccines, but they still, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, as best we can tell, still um, are effective. And, and P1 was first seen in Brazil. It's very similar to that B1351 strain that was seen in South Africa. Next slide. There are a couple of US variations. Uh, B427, B1429 were seen in Southern California. They increased transmission by about 20% and they decreased the ability of us to use monoclonal antibodies, which are drugs we can use to treat the virus and, and it makes it less effective. Um, there also were uh, mutations that were seen in New York, B1525 and B1526, and, and then one that was just recently described in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, um, which um, has a bad mutation called E484K, which is the same one as in the South African strain, the B1351, that makes the antibodies no longer effective and that decreases the effect in these vaccines. But Again, the current vaccines, the three that are currently authorized by the FDA should work. Next slide. This is my last slide. Uh, what you can see is that Moderna's vaccine was 94% effective at, at presenting symptomatic disease, 100% effective at preventing severe disease. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, 95% effective. That's really the same in statistical. And there was one person who got severe disease, so they dropped it down to 90%, but it's really just like the Moderna vaccine. They are both very effective at preventing severe disease. J&J's vaccine um, was 66% effective at preventing mild, um, moderate disease and 85% effective again for preventing severe disease, which for a single shot is a very good result. Um, J&J requires only a single dose. Um, in South Africa, 57% effective. So the J&J was able to be effective against the South African variant. And AstraZeneca, which is we've heard a lot about because that's the one they're using in Europe, it was 76% effective uh, against the strains that we see in the US, about 76% against B117, 100% effective against severe disease, but barely effective at all against the strain that was seen in South Africa. And finally, Novavax, which we haven't seen yet, the pure protein vaccine, uh, looks like it's going to be about the same as Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech's vaccine in terms of its effectiveness. And that'll probably be coming to the FDA in the next few months. I think that's it. I think I hand it off at this point. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. McKinney, for that thorough background. Dr. Garofoli, can you please discuss COVID-19 vaccination indications? Sure, so thank you so much for having me here and I'm so excited to get to be with you all this evening. So a little bit about the COVID-19 vaccine and how we really go about the process. So you all are from different states across the United States. So one of the things we really need to talk about is how you go about getting these vaccines. So the first thing that I would implore all of you to do is to really reach out to those in the community, look and see who is administering vaccines 
questions to you um, for your particular age group. So for example, I practice in West Virginia. We are vaccinating 16 years of age and up. So anybody that happens to be a West Virginian, I'm happy especially to have you here tonight with us. But we also, um, are able to vaccinate you. So you can reach out to any of your local community clinics. We have large scale community clinics in every one of our counties currently. Um, our community pharmacies are vaccinating. And so the big thing, as you can see from this chart, is we really need to um, figure out which vaccine that you are going to get and which one you're eligible to receive. So we have three vaccines, as we have already heard about. We have the Pfizer-BioNTech, and so with this vaccine, it's given two doses intramuscularly, so you're going to get it in your deltoid muscle, and it's given 21 days apart. So I always recommend that when you're scheduling that first dose of the vaccine, that you really look at your calendar ahead of time and make sure that you can be there for that second dose of the vaccine because we really want to follow these schedules as closely as possible. So the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine was the first vaccine that was granted the emergency use authorization. So what we mean by emergency use authorization that is granted when something is available that no other um, treatment is approved for. So for COVID, we do not have any approved treatments. We don't have for um, vaccines. So we have the emergency use authorizations that have been granted for all of these. These vaccines will uh, go through that process to be approved fully, um, but that will happen within the next few months. So that's when you see in that column, that last column, the date the emergency use authorization Authorization granted, you'll see that the Pfizer BioNTech was granted first, and that was on December 11th, 2020. The Moderna fell right behind that, and that was granted on um, December 18th, 2020. And this one is given two doses intramuscularly, same spot in your deltoid muscle, 28 days apart. And then finally, the Johnson & Johnson va vaccine. Um, it is one dose intramuscularly, and it was authorized at the end of February. So once they concluded their clinical trials and submitted it to the FDA, it was reviewed um, for each of these vaccines, and then they rece received that authorization so that we could begin administering them to the public. Next slide. So what's really important to all of you here in the audience today is what vaccine you are able to get. So for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, that one is authorized the lowest that we have. That is authorized for 16 years of age and up. They are currently doing trials in the younger populations, and we will see more and more expansion of the age recommendations as we progress in the next few months. There was a study out last week that showed that the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine was 100% effective in those studied in ages 12 to 15. So they are currently doing trials in younger age groups, and, and those patients that were enrolled in the trial that are age 12 to 15, it was shown to be 100% effective, which is fantastic. So this is the only vaccine for anybody that is in the audience that's 16 or 17 years of age. This is the only vaccine that you can currently get. The next vaccine is the Moderna vaccine. It is currently authorized for those 18 years of age and older. Um, they are currently doing trials just like the others in younger populations, but currently um, it's only available for those 18 years of age and older. And then finally, the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine. So you might hear it called Johnson & Johnson. You might hear it called the Janssen vaccine. So Johnson & Johnson is the parent company. So that's why you may hear different terminology utilized there. But again, this is the one shot uh, vaccine and it is authorized for those 18 years of age and up as well. So like I mentioned, clinical trials are currently underway for 12 to 15 for Pfizer and we saw that great data coming out last week and for those ages 12 to 17 for the Moderna vaccine, those trials are underway as well. Next slide. And so being a community-based pharmacist, this is a question I get a lot, is what about COVID vaccines in pregnancy? So pregnant women were excluded from the COVID-19 vaccine clinical trials. And this is normal. This is not something that's unique to COVID-19. This is something that happens with all vaccines, all treatments. We don't use them in pregnant women first. We see how it works in the general population before pregnant women and other vulnerable populations, including children, are included in these trials. So pregnant women were not included in the first round of trials for the COVID-19 vaccines. 
So what we do know is that pregnant women can have an increased risk of severe illness or negative outcomes if they become infected with the COVID-19 disease. So studies have already been shown to prove that pregnant women who get COVID-19 disease are at an increased risk for hospitalization, ICU admission, and mechanical ventilation. So um, we already know that pregnant women can have really bad outcomes if they get the disease. So when you're talking to pregnant people in your community, or if you yourself are pregnant, if you are a teacher or a teenager or anybody that you know that happens to be pregnant, you, it's very much a personal decision and you need to really look at the research that's available and weigh that risk versus benefit. So if I get COVID-19 and I'm pregnant, we know that bad things can happen. So if I get the vaccine, what, what are the benefits of getting the vaccine and preventing the illness? And so it is recommended that pregnant women do their own research and then talk with their OBGYN in order to make that very personal and very informed decision. I have a family member I know that she's pregnant and she went through this whole decision-making process and she happens to be a teacher. So extra shout out to all of you teachers who are out there doing such amazing things on a daily basis. And she was concerned. She wanted to know how she could protect her baby being back in person full time. And so she opted to get the vaccine. Um, and so it's, again, it's a very personal decision, but I really recommend that if um, this applies to you or applies to somebody that you know, that you recommend that they look for the appropriate resources. And I have some resources that are listed on these slides from the American College of Gynecology and Obstetricians. So that's a great resource to look at for um, very factually based information. Next slide. So the American College of uh, Obstetricians and Gynecologists, they say that COVID-19 vaccines should not be withheld from pregnant individuals who meet the criteria for vaccinations based on the Advisory Committee of Immunization Practices, that's what ACIP stands for, the recommended priority groups. So these are things to consider and these um, would um, be what you'd want to look at when you're making that decision. So you need to look at the level of virus activity in your community. So if the virus level is high, you would be more likely to potentially contract the virus and might want to think a little bit more about getting the vaccine. The potential efficacy of the vaccine. So with the vaccines that we have on the market currently, they are all very effective in preventing COVID-19. You need to think about the risk and potential severity of maternal disease and the effects of the disease on the unborn baby and the newborn. Um, you also need to think about the safety of the vaccine for the pregnant patient and the unborn baby. So these are all very important things to think about and consider whenever um, you are helping someone make that decision or you are making it for yourself. So again, very personal decision and things that you um, really need to think about whenever you're making that that decision. Next slide, please. So how do we track this data? So we look at the pregnancies of those vaccinated and reported to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So as of March 29th, 2021, um, there were 69,000, so almost 70,000 people that had reported to the CDC that they were pregnant when they got the vaccine. So that is what uh, information the CDC currently has. They also um, are currently enrolling pregnant individuals in a pregnancy registry. So as of March 29th, uh, almost 4,000 people were enrolled in that pregnancy registry. So you're wondering why the discrepancy in these numbers. So the first number, the 70,000, that is women who got the vaccine and they um, have, there's a web-based platform where they are tracking um, any side effects. You have to sign up for it. You don't automatically get signed up for it after receiving the vaccine. But if you want to um, provide the CDC with information about how you've done post-vaccine and how, how, um, how you're feeling as far as side effects, and if you happen to be pregnant, you include that as well. And so that is, that is where they're getting that 70,000 from. They have a separate risk registry that you then have to sign up for if you're interested. So that's why we're seeing that big discrepancy. The extra step is what those 4,000, nearly 4,000 folks have done, is gone on to report additional information to the CDC about their pregnancy and signed up for that registry to look at the outcomes. 
So one thing to really keep in mind is that typically we do not recommend that people take Tylenol or Advil after they've been vaccinated um, because it could potentially decrease the effectiveness of the vaccine. But really pregnant women who develop a fever, they really need to be taking acetaminophen or Tylenol per the package labeling if they develop a fever because we know that fevers can have ill effects on the baby that is developing. So really that is the one group that if they develop a fever after a vaccine, we really want to get them medicated to bring that fever down. Next slide. So with regards to breastfeeding, the uh, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists also recommend um, that lactating women, as we mentioned with pregnant women, they have, were not included in those clinical trials, but the vaccine should be offered to them similar to non-lactating individuals when they meet the criteria that we had already talked about. And it, there is no need for them to avoid breastfeeding after they get the vaccine. Next slide. Okay. Thank you uh, so much for that thorough coverage about COVID-19 vaccinations and their respective indications. Now, to Dr. Crosby, uh, can you please comment on pandemic policy making moving forward and how that might affect the lives of students, their parents and educators alike? All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me, uh, appreciate the invite. Um, I'd like to kind of couch my remarks regarding the future, what it might look like uh, in terms of post pandemic, hopefully we get to the other side of this some point in the next year or two, what the future might look like in terms of the next pandemic or what policy is going to need to look like to hopefully get us to where we're better prepared or as prepared as we need to be for the next time this ever happens. And it, you know, thankfully, Worldwide pandemics aren't something that happens every day of the week. Uh, this pandemic we're in now is the largest one, certainly by far since the uh, Spanish flu pandemic of the early 20th century. So if we can maintain our track record of about every hundred years or so having a worldwide pandemic, I think you know, most of us here will be happy with that. Um, you know, we certainly <clears throat> don't want to see these sorts of things happening you know, all the time. And thankfully they have it. But I think, you know, looking at it from a policy perspective, uh, this pandemic, uh, not unlike the last pandemic, is going to change a lot of things going forward. It's already changed a lot of things uh, in uh, everyday life. If you are a high school student now, you know quite well what I'm talking about, how the pandemic has changed, how you attend class, or if you attend class, or what your class looks like, or how you interact uh, with a teacher uh, over a uh, Zoom link, or some other type of virtual medium, which, you know, I was telling somebody earlier, I went to high school in the pre-internet era, so I don't exactly know how we would have been able to pull something like uh, what you guys are having to go through, pull that off uh, back when I was in high school, because we didn't have the technological capability to be able to think about doing some of the things that we're doing now, but it's, it's a very, very big difference, very big change, and you're living through it. Uh, college students are living through it. Uh, whether or not that continues to be the case, you know, even once we get past the pandemic is anybody's guess, but uh, I'll speak to that uh, briefly when we go through this. So in terms of just lessons learned, you kind of look across the continuum or spectrum of discussion regarding where were we before, where are we now, where do we need to be in the future once we get past this. I think there's some things you can kind of look at and draw some broad conclusions about where things might be going or maybe headed in the future. First one I think is, is rather exciting. Uh, and that is that uh, we're probably on the cusp of a another major revolution in medical research and medical discovery. Uh, one of the things that the pandemic has done very acutely has created a huge need to develop some very high tech types of vaccines and treatments relatively quick, very quickly actually. Uh, the natural history of vaccine development is that in most cases, it takes years, uh, four, five, six years or more in some cases to develop a new vaccine technology or thing. It takes time. Research takes time to, to, to discover, to test, to refine, all those sorts of things. 
And the fact that we've been able to go within the period of about a calendar year from basically nothing in terms of the coronavirus vaccine to now a year later where we got a half a dozen or so that are either already on the market or in the verge of coming to market is virtually unprecedented. Uh, the research cycle doesn't take place in months. Usually it takes years, sometimes it takes decades. So the fact that we've been able to move so quickly this time with regard to developing coronavirus vaccines and also treatments that are being investigated is virtually unprecedented. I think going forward, what that means or what that bodes for us is actually good. I think it's going to push some things forward a lot quicker in terms of discovery and testing. It's going to create a sense of urgency, I think, going forward to, you know, to do a better job of trying to, you know, get these things developed and tested and be a lot more efficient than we have been in the past, maybe. Uh, certainly the resources are there, unlike, you know, they've been probably in my, you know, professional career. Uh, we may not see resources like this being devoted to this area, you know, going forward. But right now the resources are there. It's a high priority. And all those resources and all that effort that's been geared towards coronavirus and treatments and vaccines, I think is gonna carry forward, uh, at least for the next several decades uh, to continue to develop these things. And also perhaps to look for uh, new break breakthroughs and treatments and prevention for other diseases like, for example, HIV and maybe even certain types of cancers. This messenger RNA technology that uh, some of the vaccines have has some very potentially exciting applications and other diseases besides just coronavirus. So the fact that we may see some of those things coming online a lot quicker. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of innovators. There's a really, there's an sense of excitement in the scientific community and in the policy community that we've kind of reached a point where you know, there's a lot of resources and we've really, we've got kind of got some momentum on our back to really kind of apply some of these things and not just for coronavirus, but for some other areas as well. So that's kind of exciting. So any of you, that even thought you might be interested in biomedical research as a possible career going forward. There probably hasn't been as good a time to think about that area as a potential career in the last hundred years or so, since so probably the era of antibiotics. Uh, but I think, you know, the next 20, 30 years is gonna be really exciting in terms of biomedical discovery and innovation. So in COVID, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, has had a role to play in that. Second thing, and this again is as a health professional, and I've been in the business for a long time. You know, when we talk about, you know, uh, treatments and we talk about, you know, managing or pr promoting population health or improving population health, you know, we talk about healthcare, we talk about treatments and we talk about vaccines and all that certainly is very important. Uh, and we talk about lifestyle and we talk about the need to improve lifestyle, modify lifestyle, mitigate lifestyle risk factors, diet, exercise, stress reduction, all that. But I can speak personally, and I know I probably speak for other health professionals as well. The implications of poor lifestyle have never been more real and more disastrous than they've been with coronavirus, with this one in particular. The individuals that tend to do the worst with COVID-19 in terms of health, in terms of outcomes, in terms of recovery, in terms of death rates, tend to be the individuals that have the worst lifestyles or are you know, subject to poor lifestyles, overweight, obesity, lack of exercise, poor diets, you know, stress, you know, a lot of stress, occupationally related stress. Those individuals have really tended to bear the brunt of a lot of the worst consequences of coronavirus. So as a health professional, I've been really kind of reinvigorated in the sense you know, we always talk about, you know, yeah, you need to change your lifestyle, you need to improve your diet, you need to exercise, you need to do stress reduction, you know, and we just kind of let it go at that and let them as patients, you know, kind of figure all that out. But I've really been reinvigorated as a healthcare professional to really start taking this thing seriously because the coronavirus has really shown the potentially deadly consequences of poor lifestyle, especially in minority populations. So if you're not as a healthcare professional really getting or haven't gotten reinvigorated to really be more aggressive about lifestyle modification than the coronavirus pandemic and the adverse consequences of poor lifestyle and the effects that it's had on population health should really be an eye opener as it has been for all of us that are, have been on the front lines of this pandemic. So that's number two. Number three, telemedicine, telehealth, it's here to stay. It's been around for a while. 
policymakers have kind of tinkered around the edges of telemedicine and telehealth the last 20 or so years with the advent of the technology that enables those sorts of things. But the coronavirus pandemic has obviously made it a reality and a necessity uh, in order for patients to have interactions with providers. In the last year, a lot of it has had to be through telehealth and telemedicine because they weren't seeing patients face to face because of the concerns with the coronavirus. So because of that, payers have had to be a lot more aggressive in terms of incentivizing the use of telemedicine and telehealth. And even when we get past this pandemic, I don't think that's gonna change at all. The payers are behind it now, the financial incentives are there to do it. It probably is the best thing to do for a lot of different types of patients. So I think going forward, if you have any interest at all as a, you know, in telemedicine, telehealth, either on the technology side or the health professional side, I think that's an area that's only going to continue to grow in the future as technology continues to evolve. And can hospital at home that's enabled by technology be that far behind? Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. It'd be interesting to see which way that goes. Uh, the uh, issue regarding health disparities uh, has been an issue in and around healthcare for as long as I've been in healthcare, 30 plus years. Uh, COVID really hasn't changed a lot in terms of our understanding of disparities, but it's made them a lot more obvious and a lot more difficult to acknowledge in terms of, you know, it's always been there, but the pandemic and the adverse consequences, especially the mortality consequences of COVID have been a lot more severe for minorities. And we know that very clearly, the data is very clear on that. So we can no longer pay lip service to dealing with disparities in access and disparities in outcomes. So I expect policymaking in the future is gonna be a lot more aggressive to really get at some of those root causes of those disparities. Because those disparities in terms of death rates and severity are real and they are disproportionately affecting minority populations. So that's gonna be a much bigger policy issue, I think, going forward. Because of the nature of the pandemic and the fact that we've been told to stay home or not go out at least for a while or limit the amount that we go out. You know, people still have careers and jobs and have to go to school and things like that. So virtual work uh, was part of the mix of work-related options that you had as part of a career. Uh, but sometimes it was kind of a, you know, optional thing or you can only do it under certain conditions or with permission or something like that. But I think going forward, virtual work is going to be much more mainstream. Uh, your workplace 20 years from now, when you all will be out, you know, in the workforce, probably on your first or second job, will probably be a healthy mix of virtual versus in person. Uh, I don't think virtual work is going to get any less important. It's probably going to even be more important than it is now, uh, even when we get past the pandemic. So the traditional Monday to Friday nine to five job is probably going the way of the dinosaur. Unfortunately, for those of us that have been doing virtual stuff this past year, it's kind of a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing and that allows you to get things done virtually that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do because of the restrictions due to the pandemic. But it's a curse in the sense that you're almost always, it seems like you're almost always on the job. You can't get away from it. It's always there. I think that's kind of the way things are going to be going forward. Even when we get past the pandemic, I think virtual options for work are going to be much more mainstream. And the job of the future probably will have a significant virtual component associated with it in most areas that you go into. So I think that's going to be something to look forward to or look forward to in terms of what's coming. Will we ever feel comfortable again gathering as part of large crowds? What are the implications of those types of questions as far as going to, say, a baseball game or going to a football game or crowding into an amphitheater or an arena to watch a music concert? Will we ever get back to a point where we feel comfortable getting into those situations where we're part of, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of individuals in a fairly confined location. Don't know the answer to that. Uh, people tend to have fairly short memories. Uh, but uh, if, you know, if you go back to the last pandemic of the uh, early 20th century, it took the survivors of that pandemic many, many years or decades to get to a point where they felt comfortable doing things that they had done up to that point in time. So, We'll have to wait and see on that, but you kind of wonder 
uh, about restaurants and you kind of wonder about movie theaters and things like that. Well, these things come back and if they do come back, will they come back the way they were before? Those are things we don't know the answer to right now. It's probably going to be very different going forward in the future. It's just a matter of what it's going to look like. What do we need to do to get ready for the next one? There will be a next one. Hopefully it'll be a far out into the future. It's based on recent history, about every 80 to 100 years, something like this happens. I think most of us that are in the field, especially in the policy arena, probably have been pretty critical and rightfully so of how we have, you know, we were late to respond as, as, a, as a society, as a country. I think once we got started on the response, we've done okay, but get, it was late getting started. There was a real lack of coordination uh, at various levels in terms of you know responses and who's doing what, and who's responsible for what, and who can tell who to do what. Very disjointed uh, for a long period of time, and that disjointedness and lack of coordination for that period of time, you know, really set us back months, you know, several months for sure. Uh, to the point where we're now still trying to recover from that. So, you know, next time, certainly most of us feel like we can do a better job of responding if, when it happens, and it will, uh, doing, doing a better job coordinating things. Uh, we're going to have to decide who we are as a society. You know, wh who's going to be responsible for what? What do we need to have, you know, in place to prepare for the next one? Um, you know, do we need more of a federal top-down type response? Do we need someone that has designated responsibility for making these decisions? Are we going to leave it to the individual states, the individual governors, the individual cities, the individual mayors that we've largely done in this case to make these decisions? Is that best for what we need to get done? Is that best for protecting the health of society? Uh, we've got some, we've got some real, you know, the whole issue of federalism and you know, who calls the shots and, you know, should it be the federal government? Should it be state governments? You know, who should, be the one making these decisions. So we've got a lot of soul searching, I think, to do as a society, as a country going forward, because, uh, you know, arguably the lack of coordination and the delay in our response has probably cost us far too many lives uh, in this pandemic to where we feel comfortable that that's the way we need to do it going forward. So what the next response looks like, I think we need to be better prepared for that. And we need to kind of have some of these things mapped out uh, ahead of time. And the last one is directly relevant to, you know, high school students, college students. I teach college uh, at the college level. And we're dealing with a lot of the same issues that high school students are as it relates to the classroom and what it looks like now and in the future. Uh, is Again, virtual classrooms, is that going to be a thing? Is that going to be here to stay? Um, will students have the option to attend virtual classes in the future? Can they get entire degrees virtually? Uh, in a lot of different areas. Uh, we'll see. Based on what I've seen in the last year, uh, the technology is certainly there to support a lot of virtual learning options, but uh, we'll, uh, but unfortunately, universities at least really aren't set up in terms of the economic model to be able to support, you know, a majority of virtual learning. They just, they've got too much brick and mortar, too much overhead costs that have to be paid for with, you know, students on campus and the dorm rooms. So if the virtual learning thing continues to grow the way it has in the last year, it's going to be a kind of a tough sell, a day of reckoning, so to speak, for, uh, for colleges, because uh, the colleges were not set up, developed, uh, and funded based on virtual learning. They were based on traditional learning, you know, butts in the seats, people in the dorm, people in the dorms, that sort of thing. And if we shift away from that, it's going to be it's going to be tough. So I'm not really sure what that's going to look like in the future, but it's I don't think virtual learning is going away. Uh, I think it's going to be a part of what we do in terms of educational things going forward. So those are just some of my observations based on what I've seen. So uh, thank you for uh, listening to me and I'll turn it back over to uh, whoever's next, Dr. Lefman. Thank you. Thank you so much for your great insight. So at this time, we'll move into the question and answer portion of today's event. So earlier today, we did speak about variants. Now, is there a means to combat them? And if so, what is the best approach? Uh, so I'll go ahead and take that one. And I would say the best approach is vaccination because uh, variants require basically to get new variants. Um, they're usually apparently occurring in people who are 
a little immune compromised. And, and so we have a sustained infection where the virus keeps replicating and they get a little bit of immune response. And so they select out variants that are resistant to uh, the immune response. That seems to be the mechanism. And there've been a couple of really good, well-documented cases where that occurred. Um, but the best thing is you stop the circulation of the virus so people aren't infected at all. And that's what the vaccine will do. If enough people get vaccinated, we stop the circulation of the virus, we don't get new variants. And the current vaccines that we have should be effective at preventing the variants that have already occurred. The other thing that's interesting is if somebody has been infected by the B1351 strain, data from last week's make it look like people who were infected with that are pretty much resistant to all the known strains of SARS-CoV-2, uh, at least in a test tube. And, and so if we make vaccines that are based on that version of the virus, we may be able to protect against all the known variants that we've currently uh, encountered. Thank you so much for that thorough answer. Now, studies have demonstrated that all of the vaccines have prevented hospitalization. Are they in fact safe? And if given a choice, is one vaccine better than the rest? So I can take this one. And I think right now, what we're seeing is that we don't really have a choice given because the vaccines in most places are still in short supply. So unless you're that 16 to 17 year old that needs Pfizer, you don't have a choice there because that is currently the only vaccine that is recommended. But these vaccines have um, a great safety profile. The only people that we are really recommending do not get the vaccines are those that have um, had a reaction, a severe allergic reaction to a previous dose of the vaccine, or if they have an allergic reaction to any of the components of the vaccine. And the other way of looking at it is they all work. Great. Thank you for all of those thorough answers. Um, we have several vaccines as uh, have been stated earlier today. Now, some of them are two-shot vaccines, and there's at least one that is a one-shot vaccine. What is the difference between the two shots, and do we even need a second shot? Well, the biology of it is it's uh, the two-shot vaccines are using a principle called prime boost. And the prime boost approach means that you give somebody one dose and that sets up the immune system, it reacts to it, but it doesn't get all the way to a full immune reaction and it still boosts double. And if you give another dose of vaccine, three, four, five weeks later, depending on what, what, what's possible, um, you'll get a big jump in the antibody levels and T cell response, which makes a person protected for longer because those antibodies are gonna last for longer and there are more B cells that have memory. They will be able to come back and create antibodies quickly if you get another encounter with the virus. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, is a, uh, because it's a double-stranded DNA virus, uh, it produces after only one dose, just about the same level of response without having to go through a prime boost. So at least at the moment, it looks like all three of them should be able to produce good long-term responses. And by long-term, at the moment, all we know is about six months, um, but we'll see over time. And our hope is that what we do is we create this pool of memory B cells, which are the ones that produce the antibody, that they will be sitting there waiting. And as soon as you run into the next coronavirus, those antibodies will be produced much more quickly, and that'll shut down the infection much more quickly than we've had in the past. Thank you for that. On that same note, um, what happens if, for example, someone were, were to miss the second dose of their vaccine? Obviously, a lot of the indications state you should get the second vaccine in a certain number of days. What would be your recommendation for that individual? 
So it's recommended to stick to the um, recommended intervals between vaccines as much as possible. But it then is said that you can go up to six weeks after the first dose to get the second dose for the mRNA vaccines. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that's easy. It's one and done. But for the others that require multiple doses, we have up to six weeks. But then the CDC does say that if the dose, second dose is not given within that time frame, you do not restart the series. You just give the second dose and you're done. Thank you so much for that thorough response. Um, earlier today, we have done some extensive discussion about the variants. How effective would you say uh, the vaccines are against the variants, especially with so many new variants coming about uh, and what do you view as in the future of how the vaccines will be able to combat the variants that are currently uh, that, that are currently being found? Okay, well, I will use a shorthand of the um, UK strain, South African Brazilian strain, those three strains. I could use the numbers, but people have trouble keeping track of the numbers. Uh, the, the UK strain, the B117 strain, actually responds pretty much as does the original B1 strain. So um, those people are protected. They're protected by all the vaccines, including the AstraZeneca vaccine that's being used extensively in Europe. Um, the B1351, the one in, from South Africa originally, is now spread elsewhere, including a lot of the uh, United States. The B1351 is resistant to the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, but it responds well in, in test tubes less well, but well enough that you're protected if you've had the Moderna, Pfizer, or J&J &J vaccine. So I think we're going to be okay with the variants that we've currently seen. And one of the things we've also seen by looking at variants occurring in different parts of the world, the same things tend to happen the same mutations tend to occur. So the virus is driven towards certain mutations. So we aren't seeing, there may be a limitation to how far it can go before it stops being able to attach to the ACE2 the way it was attaching. So we may reach a point where, where like the vaccines using the B1351 in the vaccine are able to protect us against all the extant strains. That's, that's entirely uh, in the realm of the possible. Thank you so much. A year has passed, and in some regions of the world, the number of cases is still increasing, despite vaccination efforts. Why is that? And is there anything we can do about it? Well, I don't want to leap in too quickly, but it's, it's, there's a race. There are the variants that are more contagious. They're 50 to 60% more contagious, and, and they are contagious for a younger group than was um, before. They're more virulent. So what we're seeing is this race between a virus that's able to find the person who is susceptible more efficiently and effectively and vaccination. And, and in, in parts of the world where we're getting good vaccination levels, like in Israel, for example, the vaccination levels are very high and, and the virus is losing. People are getting, there. I just saw an article this morning in the Times about people going to concerts again. You know, we want to get back to concerts, we want to get back to church, we want to get back to all those things that we like doing. Uh, and in order to do that, we've got to get a very high level of vaccination. Very much appreciated. A year has passed and we still lack a specific anti-COVID-19 therapy. Do you feel we will ever have one? And if so, out of the agents out there, which to you looks the most promising? Well, the one that looks the most promising is one that was originally developed at Emory, um, and it had a number EIDD, um, and I can't remember what its current uh, name is. It's being developed by Merck. It's an oral drug. It was originally being developed as an influenza drug. So the reason it's taken a while is it takes longer to develop a drug than it does a vaccine. There's a lot of work already on the vaccines that had gone on because many of these are derived from the same approach that was taken to some Ebola vaccines. So they're modifying the same strategies. Um, for drugs, it's harder. So they're trying to take drugs off the shelf and see if they'll work against uh, coronavirus. And, and very few of them have turned out to be all that effective. Uh, remdesivir, for example, is mediocre. It was developed as uh, an anti-Ebola drug, didn't work that well. Um, but this EID um, drug 
um, whose name I should remember but can't, um, is, uh, looks to be promising and is currently in phase three studies, um, has gone through all the standard progress and is currently in clinical trials and we'll soon know how effective it is. Thank you. Uh, shifting more towards, I guess, a policy type of perspective, there are individuals who are expressing COVID fatigue. What advice would you give to these uh, people? And do you envision this pandemic ever being controlled? And if so, what in your definition slash opinion does controlled mean? Uh, COVID fatigue is real. Anybody that has to go through 800,000 Zoom meetings is very aware of COVID fatigue. Um, it's real. What to do? Get vaccinated. The sooner we can get in the neighborhood of herd immunity, the sooner this thing's going to get past us. Uh, and the sooner we can get on with normal activity. So I'd say the, the message for COVID fatigue is get vaccinated and tell somebody that you know that they need to get vaccinated. So. They're over very simplistic, but that's until we get to herd immunity, uh, we're not going to get past it. So. I would agree with that. And we also need to keep doing what we're doing. We're all tired. We've all been doing this for over a year. But the best things that we can do are, as Dr. Crosby said, get vaccinated and then also keep masking, keep doing what we can to protect those that are not able to get vaccinated. My four-year-old can wear a mask appropriately. I think that we all can. I think that that's something that we need to keep doing um, so that we can protect others. We can protect those that are not able to get the vaccine, just like we do with any other vaccine preventable disease, because we really want to ensure that we can do our parts to get uh, through this awful pandemic. And, and to answer, I, I would do want to give the final answer on the last one. I looked up while we were sitting here answering the other questions, what the name of this drug was and why I couldn't remember it. So it's molnupiravir, um, which is just, you know, rolls off the tongue uh, so easily. Um, also known as EIDD2801. And, um, but that's an oral drug that is in phase three development and Merck and a company called Ridgeback Therapeutics are the ones that are developing it. Thank you so much for all of those uh, thorough comments. And thank you so much, Dr. McKinney, for your th thoroughness in making sure that uh, our audience is as informed as possible. Um, moving on to the next question. The concept of long COVID has recently been coined. Can someone please uh, tell our audience what long COVID is, how it presents, how we can prevent it, Thank you. Long COVID is a real phenomenon, and it is defined as a, an individual that has gotten a positive COVID test result, confirmatory test result, and has experienced one or more either typical or atypical COVID symptoms, of which there are many in that list. Uh, keeps expanding, it seems like, about every week. Uh, but those symptoms, one or more of those symptoms, they don't do the normal virus thing where they come and you feel bad for a week or two and then it kind of gets better and it kind of eventually goes away. The long COVID folks report consistently having one or more of those symptoms for at least 12 weeks, which is three plus months. And that's worse than any flu I've ever heard of, um, although there's some pretty bad cases of the flu out there. Um, uh, so that's, you know, tw think about it, you know, feeling fatigued or coughing or whatever the symptoms are and having that for 12 or more weeks, that's long COVID. And that's, uh, that's an interesting phenomenon. There's some UK data that was published in the last week or so that suggested about one in seven persons that are COVID positive will actually report long COVID symptoms. And based on the UK data, it looks like middle-aged females, for whatever reason, are the most likely to report experiencing long COVID symptoms in terms of you know, treatment, prevention. Uh, this is a relatively new phenomenon. We're not really sure. Uh, some, you know, it might be something they have to contend with for many, many years after the original infection. So we're, we're, learning, we're learning a lot about this virus that we, we didn't know about, and it continues to evolve. But it is a real phenomenon, for sure.
regarding education, what in your opinion will the classroom of the future look like post COVID? Will virtual, we did speak about vir virtual learning before, uh, but in your opinions, do you feel it will be the new norm, so to speak, even in secondary and post-secondary education? Well, the technology is there and it's kind of like, you know, once the technology is there and you get used to doing it, it's hard to put the toothpaste back in the tube type thing. I think virtual learning is going to be around as long as the technology enables it, whether it's going to be, you know, primary or supplemental or you know, take the place of traditional classroom or supplement it or what's it going to look like. I don't think we know the answer to that yet, but I don't think uh, I'm speaking of, you know, teaching the college level. It's uh, we have a hard time getting students to come back to class now. They like the, a lot of them like the virtual learning. Most some of them don't. But uh, getting them, you know, to transition back to the way it was before has been a bit of a challenge. You know, we've got folks now that they just want to do virtual. They don't want to be around people that are sick. So, well, I don't. I'm not sure. We'll, we'll find out. But I, I think virtual learning is going to be out there, and it's going to be an option. Whether it's a, you know, an option or it's mandatory, I'm not really sure what that's going to look like. But I do know colleges are in a world of hurt, by and large, if they decide to go virtual or predominantly virtual. The, the, the whole model of higher education is going to be completely upended if, if that's the way it works out. And I think it's different based on which level of education. I have some educators in my family that are um, teaching the younger ones and they see some detriments for those kids, especially if they live in impoverished areas with not being in the classroom. So I, I think it'll be a mix. I think like Dr. Crosby said, well, we have the technology there in a lot of instances. So I can, I, think that we will con continue to use it in the future, but I think that in some instances in person is better for some people. So I think that we'll see a mix going forward in the future, but now that we have everything in place, it's definitely gonna stick around as an option. Great. Now, obviously this is not the first pandemic and most likely it will not be the last. How can we as a society ensure that we are better prepared for the next major pandemic? Well, hopefully, like I said, we have plenty of time to prepare for the next one. Um, but, you know, humans tend to have notoriously short memories. I mean, it, it's seared into our brains as we're going through it. But you could probably have said the same thing about the generation that went through the Spanish flu pandemic. Uh, you know, that it was seared into their memories because they lived through it. But then, you know, there are interceding generations that don't have any experience with that at all. So, you know, it doesn't pass on from generation to generation. So you tend to forget the lessons that you learned the last time. You know, I, I just feel like the next one, you know, we're going to have to be much better prepared. Hopefully we will be much better prepared, I think. We've really got to do some soul searching, you know, as, as a society, as, as policymakers, because I don't think most people would, would argue with the fact that we just we could have done much better on this one. I think we've made up for a lot of, you know, lost time in a relatively short period of time, and that's been good. But, um, you know, Dr. Burks mentioned in her comments the other day that she felt like that uh, we really we could have done a lot better if we had tried to do better we did do better that you know we'd still have people that would die from it but maybe it wouldn't have been maybe as severe as it has i don't know it's, it's kind of you know monday morning monday morning quarterback in a little bit i guess but i don't think many people in the policy sphere would look at the way that we or really any other developed country in the world for that matter has gone about trying to manage this and would argue that we did everything that we possibly could have done in this case, to kind of you know avert the worst of it, especially you know in, in the U.S., so we I think most policy folks in healthcare, folks in healthcare would would probably agree that you know we definitely can do better in a lot of areas, and we we really need to kind of focus on that going forward. Uh, you know, being better prepared next time, and if we are better prepared, maybe the outcomes will be better. So there there are several things that we could do. Um, first of all, testing. We, we were wholly unprepared. I mean, you looked at, they were doing hundreds of thousands of tests in Korea before we could do a few thousand tests. So we really screwed up our ability to do the testing early on. Um, we should have had um, 
uh, with development of vaccines next time, we're gonna have a platform because the mRNA vaccine strategy is now well worked out and we're gonna be in a position to be able to develop vaccines quite quickly. It was pretty incredible that we went from getting a virus for the first time and a year later, we've got a vaccine that we're testing in people. I mean, that's incredible. And um, it involved you know, isolating the virus, having the sequence, using the sequence to make a vaccine. We've made huge strides. So I have hope that we'll be able to respond more quickly in many ways, but there are things we need to have ready. We need to keep that vaccine um, platform ready. We need to keep the research going. And we also need to have better public health infrastructure because what we learned is, for example, when we want to start vaccinating, we didn't have a way to, we didn't have a system for getting vaccines out to people. There's some states like West Virginia that did pretty well, but there were a lot of states where it was just uh, chaos and still is chaos because they didn't have a public health infrastructure because basically they let it rust. So um, we need to maintain that next time. Totally agree. The public health infrastructure issue is we're going to have to get serious about it and resource it, or we're going to be right back where the same fix where we're in this time if we don't do that. And I think speaking as a West Virginian, one of the things that made us really successful was really having all hands on deck. All healthcare practitioners, um, along with our National Guard, have been working together in one big room. So if you have a question, you can go over to one of the other um, cubicles of another person and you can get things worked through pretty quickly. So it has really helped to work together as a team to help be so successful in our vaccination efforts. There has been a lot of information about COVID-19 over the past year, and even every single day we hear something new. What resources would you recommend that our audience read and our watch to stay up to date? Well, it's pretty amazing how much even the common, the public press, uh, you know, the, be it the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Associated Press, a lot of good information gets out there. Um, uh, avoid the sort of the internet quagmire. Um, but there's a lot of good information. And the CDC's website is uh, consistent and has a lot of good information on it. Stay off social media. Do not take your public health or vaccination advice from anything to do. We are in the same zip code as social media. Please. I also can recommend our AAMC website, aamc.org slash COVID, because we maintain um, both a newsletter that every week puts out what's current in research related to uh, SARS-CoV-2 and also um, background information like uh, uh, treatment strategies. Great. Um, we've received some questions from the audience, and so at this time, we will present them to our speakers. How can someone with a history of seizures after vaccination be confident about getting a COVID vaccine? Well, I don't, I don't see that a history of seizures now. Some people may have seizures related to fever, and um, there is some fever. Um, with second dose of many of the vaccines, but the risk of the virus is probably worse than the risk of the vaccine. It's a choice that you should make in discussion with your physician who knows your seizure pattern, knows how well medicated and how controlled your seizures are, and knows whether fever is a specific risk for your um, particular seizure disease. For the concerned parents out there, how can they feel comfortable about possible long-term health concerns related to the vaccine? Well, we know short-term that they're safe. Long-term, we'll learn more as we go along. Um, the comment that I'm reading referenced the old DES and thalidomide issues, but that was a lifetime and a half ago. The infrastructure for studying safety and efficacy of all drugs, vaccines, et cetera, is so far advanced now compared to what it was in 1962. It's not even, it's, it's not even apples to oranges. It's apples to something, some fruit that doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, so that's not really a relevant comparison. But what we know short term is the vaccines, are, all of them are exceptionally safe and the risks associated with not being vaccinated are far greater. So, 
And it's actually pretty, if you, I, I, so I've had my Moderna vaccine, so I had both doses. And with it, the CDC, uh, I, I was enlisted in something called vSafe. So every day for the first week after my vaccine, they ask, what are you feeling? What are your side effects? What do you feel? And, and then the next, um, then it's once a week for another five weeks. So they really have followed for a long period of time to see, and that's, you know, thousands and thousands of people. So we know these vaccines, they've not been given to a hundred million people. If there was something that was gonna go awry, we probably should have seen it. So these are really safe vaccines. And, you know, the mRNA, as I said, goes away because it's digested. So it's, these are not, these are really safe vaccines. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we have a question from a parent. Uh, she says that she has a child with type one diabetes. Is it highly recommended to get vaccinated as a precaution? And when vaccinated, do you recommend to quarantine away from the child for a few days afterwards? So that's a great question and I can answer that. I think what the parent might be concerned about is live vaccines. So this, the vaccines that are available are not live vaccines. So we would have no worries of you transmitting anything to your child. You should get vaccinated to protect your child. Um, having a close family member that has type one diabetes that's been vaccinated, I um, would strongly recommend that you get it and your child once they are of age gets the vaccine as well to protect themselves. But there is no chance that you would pass the vaccine on to your child um, after getting vaccinated. So no need to stay away from them. Right. Thank you so much for that thorough response. Um, regarding symptoms and possible side effects of the vaccine. So we have a question asking, is drowsiness generally a symptom of receiving the COVID-19 vaccine? And if so, should high school or college students be prepared for this when they receive the vaccine? Absolutely, that is a side effect that we've seen. We're actually vaccinating a lot of college students right now at our institution. And it is something that a lot of people have seen has been very tired after the vaccine. Um, so when we actually first started vaccinating at long-term care facilities, we would recommend not vaccinating the entire staff on the same day because people might be out because of feeling tired, because of feeling a headache, which are normal side effects of the vaccine. So that is completely normal. I recommend that people, if they can, get it towards the end of the week and then take it easy for the weekend and just relax, don't try to overdo it. Um, it depends on each person though. I was fine and I had a headache after my first dose and I felt perfectly fine after my second dose. Some people feel worse after their second dose because their body has been exposed again and they're continuing to build up that immunity. Right. Oh, uh, did you want to say something, Dr. McKinney? I was just going to say, yeah, you just, it, it makes just be common sensible. The second dose, you don't have to worry about the first dose in most cases. The second dose is just a good idea to plan to have the next day off. Thank you so much. Now, we have a question asking about any association or correlation between the blood types and their, of their association with the severity of cases of COVID-19. So the qu question runs like this. Is it true that people with Rh negative or O blood types are less likely to have severe cases of COVID? There were for a while some statistical studies suggesting a difference in um, severity, but it's one of those things where it's statistically significantly different, but not clinically meaningful. So the difference is you might be able to find it, but it didn't actually mean anything because for any given person, uh, no matter what your blood type, you could still get sick. Great, thank you. And, so and you can still benefit from vaccination regardless. Oh, absolutely. So don't take it. Well, because I'm a certain blood type, I, if I get it, it'll be less severe. So I'm not going to worry about getting the vaccine. That's, uh, yeah, you, m major benefits regardless of blood type. Great. Speaking of vaccinations, um, in your respective opinions, moving forward, do you think that there will need to be a yearly vaccine for COVID? I bet there will be. Um, but, you know, it's, what's interesting is we will see how long it lasts. And the other thing is, if it's not circulating, if it turns out it doesn't circulate, um, then maybe we won't. Um, and the other thing is, it may be enough that 
what we'll see is a year from now, people who aren't boosted and get COVID just get mild disease. We just don't know what it's going to be like. So I think it's still to unfold whether we're going to end up with a booster or not. If we do end up with a booster, I would bet it's of a different variant than the one that was circulating the previous year, so that we go from one variant to the next. And so we might get a boost for that, but only time will tell. And we've begun doing studies on uh, making vaccines with the other variants just to be ready. Thank you so much. Well, at this time, uh, I would like to thank all of you for, for joining us this evening. I want to um, thank our panelists for being here with us this evening. I know you're all incredibly, incredibly busy with your professions and being in the middle of a pandemic, I know that your time is valuable. So thank you so much for being here tonight with us. Um, thank you to our panel sponsor one more time, Health Professions Week. Everyone, please click on that link in the chat if you are interested in health professions. Definitely attend Health Professions Week later this year. It is the number one event for potential uh, health profession connections. So definitely attend that event. Um, don't forget to register for our upcoming webinars. You can go to nshss.org slash events slash upcoming dash webinars to register for all of those. Each and every one of them are free. So we will see you at future webinars. Um, and if you enjoyed this panel, this free panel tonight, definitely consider donating to the NSHSS Foundation. This is our nonprofit side of the organization that provides funding for scholarships for our outstanding students. So uh, all of those donations go straight to uh, funding scholarships for our students. So at this time, I will conclude this panel this evening. Thank you so much um, again to our panelists, to Dr. Leifman for moderating, especially tonight. Um, everyone stay safe. Please make informed decisions about your vaccine decision. Uh, definitely, I think the overarching thing we heard tonight is consult with your physician specifically. Um, make sure to have those considerations as you move forward through the, hopefully the end of this pandemic very soon. With that, um, I will bid everyone good night and stay safe. Bye-bye.